Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. Over the past several years, American institutions have faced challenges that have placed an enormous amount of stress and strain on them. Some of those challenges have been emergent phenomenon, while other challenges have been intentionally inflicted by political actors. In addition to the institutions themselves faltering for their own internal reasons, and in some senses being fed by that faltering, the American people have lost confidence in the legitimacy of government, business, media, and more. The downstream effects of this institutional crisis and loss of confidence have been higher than usual embraces of conspiracy theories and other forms of unreality. The January 6th riot at the United States Capitol was a striking and vivid example of the consequences of these problems. Today, I talk with Yuval Levin, Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and the Editor of National Affairs, about these institutional crises, the failures of political leadership in this populist age, the growing embrace of forms of unreality, and what can be done about it. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Act in Line on our website at actin.org slash actinline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. I'm joined today by Yuval Levin, who is Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and the Editor of National Affairs. He is the author of two recent pieces, which we will put in the show notes for this episode, Failures of Leadership in a Populist Age, published January 4th in National Review, and Trump's Rebellion Against Reality, published on January 7th at The Dispatch. He is also the author of the 2020 book, A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. Yuval, thank you so much for joining us on Act in Line. Thanks very much for having me. So the topic of your book in 2020 is on institutions, the status of institutions in America, really when you were writing it leading up to that 2020 publication. It's now almost a year later from when that book was released. What is your assessment of the status of American institutions right now? Is it roughly the same as you thought it was when you were writing the book? Do you think it's worsened? Is it a mixed bag? Well, it's a mixed bag, but I do think in some important ways things look worse. I mean, that book is about the the sources and the consequences of our loss of confidence in institutions. And I think we've certainly seen that loss of trust uh, exacerbate and show some consequences that really weren't evident uh, at the beginning of 2020. I, w- I would say there are there are moments in the book where I say, well, at least we don't have riots in the street. There are moments in the book where I say, well, at least we don't have political violence at the level we've seen in the past uh, in America when people have lost confidence. And in the meantime, we've seen some violence in the streets and we've seen some political violence uh, very recently. I do think these things are very much connected to the loss of trust and confidence that's described in the book. But in some important ways, things do look worse uh, at the beginning of this new year. You mentioned a, a loss of confidence. Um, I think you get at this in I think both of the pieces that you wrote, one for National Review and one for The Dispatch, that... It, it may have been that there were circumstances that were eroding our confidence in institutions. And John Podhoretz at Commentary had a theory. Uh, I've heard him offer that it's really the, the Catholic priest sex abuse scandal is where he kind of pins things as starting to spiral out of control. Um, these are actions by many actors within different institutions. But it seems to me that we have uh, a more concerted effort now than uh, we did you know, back 10, 15 years ago to actively erode people's confidence in institutions, to tell you that the institutions are failing, even if they might be institutions that are not failing to the extent that these people are making the arguments for. 
Yeah, I think the the causes of that loss of trust run very deep, and it's not something that just started in this century, though it has accelerated some. Um, and surely it does have to do with some traditional forms of corruption, like the like the priest scandal and other scandals, uh, scandals around uh, the the Iraq War, scandals around the financial crisis, uh, all of which have built up to a kind of sense that a lot of our core institutions are not functioning well, are not competent, are not telling us the truth sometimes. Um, That has certainly contributed to the kinds of problems we've seen. I think there's also been a a transformation in the background of the ways in which we understand the world, the media environment, which has become fragmented and in a sense kind of personalized, that makes it very difficult now to know who to trust and, and whose expertise to take seriously. Um, We've also seen a kind of transformation of people's understanding of what our institutions are for. Even people within those institutions increasingly think of them as existing to allow them to have a platform to participate in the culture war. And so you find members of Congress using the institution as a stage to put on a show. And you find that same thing happening in the academy, in journalism, uh, in the media. And as that happens, that the, the crucial line between fact and fiction, entertainment and reality comes to be blurred in ways that feed very dangerously into the dynamics of an increasingly populist society. And one of the consequences of that is the growing power and prevalence of conspiracism. Um, there's always some level of conspiracy mindedness in the politics of a democracy. We in America have particularly always seen some of that But I think that the blurring of the line between reality and unreality has meant that conspiracism has seeped into our politics in a much more profound way than we've seen before. And that is a big part of what has driven the the distinct kind of uh, contemporary loss of trust in institutions and kind of collapse of confidence in our political culture. It seems to me now that it's there's a level of political profitability in sowing that kind of distrust that I don't know that would have been true 10, 20, maybe 10 years ago, but 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, I'm not as well versed in American history as I probably should be, but is there, are there any precedents for that in American history? And, you know, assumedly then that we were able to pull out of it in some way, um, is there any precedent? And, and why do you think at this time it has become so politically profitable to sow that kind of distrust rather than offer a more inspiring vision of what America is supposed to be and what makes us great? Well, I do think that there are times we can find in our history when it has been politically advantageous to engage in this kind of thing. And in any case, when it has been very, very prominent and pervasive. If you look at the politics of the early republic or of the years before the American Revolution, the the degree of conspiracism in the politics of that society is astonishing. And it is really, in many ways, worse than what we're seeing here now. Um, the forms of media were different, and there was less immediacy. Things were moved less quickly. But looking at American politics at the end of the 18th century, looking at British politics at the end of the 18th century, the, the kinds of conspiracies you'd find um, some of these were were religiously infused. They were anti-Catholic conspiracies, for example, that ran very, very deep in British politics. I mean, you know, I, I wrote a dissertation at the University of Chicago years ago about the, about British politics in the era of the French Revolution. And what you find when you look at people's letters, uh, private correspondence, is that very serious people in positions of real power and authority believed all kinds of crazy things about Catholics or about Protestants, the group they weren't part of, and about what was happening in the politics that they were involved with, things that you just cannot imagine how this broke through their filters of reality. And I think we're seeing something like that here. Um, There are advantages in it for anyone who doesn't perceive themselves to be in a position of power to weaken people's sense of the legitimacy of those in authority. And we are living in a very populist moment, a a moment when a lot of people have real skepticism about whether the people who have power and privilege and money in our society have earned it, whether they really should have it. Um, That, I think, is ultimately what defines a populist era. 
And this is clearly a moment when there is a lot of doubt about why are those people in power? When our politics, you might say, is at least as much about who rules as about the direction of our society. And that's a situation in which sowing doubt and, um, and, and skepticism of power uh, is very advantageous. And look, we're a free society, we're a democratic society, we're properly skeptical of power, but there have to be some constraints and boundaries on this so that we can have a way of telling truth from lies and fact from fiction. And I think we're at a point now where it's become very difficult for a lot of people to do that. What role do you think the status of education plays in all of this? I, I was in a conversation with uh, a friend last night, actually, where she had expressed a concern over the amount of disinformation or misinformation that exists out there. And I, I offered somewhat similar to what you said, that if you probably go back to uh, Revolutionary War, post-Revolutionary War times, I imagine there was probably a lot of disinformation. Uh, just the immediacy of communication wasn't that. Um, do, do you fault the failure of our efforts of education, not just in the sense of being able to discern between what is factually true and what is not factually true, but when you combine it with um, more of a the popular now Howard Zinn vision of America that says we focus really only on the faults of the country. Yeah. That he's explicit on this in, in the book, that it is the point of view from the oppressed and only from the oppressed. Uh, is, is this a, a not fatal combination, but a very dangerous combination uh, of those two things? Yeah, I think it is a very dangerous combination, and I think it points in this direction. It is it is profoundly populist. I mean, if you think about Howard Zinn's argument, it is basically that all power is illegitimate. And that's not true. And it's also a very dangerous way to think about how our society functions, because it leads you inherently to reject the claims of anyone who asserts any expertise or authority, ultimately. Um, whether that's Howard Zinn's intention or not, I don't know. But um, he wrote a very, very distorted history of the United States, which has become quite pervasive in defining, shaping people's understanding of the country. But I, I think there is also this deeper problem of a broader loss of trust, a sense that there's, there's no such thing as legitimate expertise, legitimate authority. And, you know, our country, in order to stay free, has to live in a kind of balance, a sort of tension between the commitment to the freedom of the individual and the commitment to the order of society as a whole. And that means that we do have to have some skepticism of people in power. It also means that we have to have some skepticism of the broader public. The Constitution, if you think about the structure of it, really encourages those two twin skepticisms at the same time in a way that can sustain some balance. It expects elites and leaders to constrain the people in some ways, and it certainly expects the people to constrain elites and leaders. I think we we've lost the sense that that first set of constraints is legitimate and have come to the view, and you hear it expressed by a lot of politicians now, that their only job is really just to speak for their voters, whatever it is those voters want to say. And if what those vo voters want to say is completely divorced from reality, then these politicians are willing to just be completely divorced from reality, sometimes knowingly so, I think often so. And that creates a dangerous situation. I mean, literally dangerous in that it, we've seen in the past couple of weeks in Washington what it can look like when truly a fantasy world confronts, confronts reality. Um, and that intersection is a dangerous place to be. I think our politics has to be careful about sifting truth from falsehood and making sure that we're directed to reality and not fantasy. And we're doing a very poor job of that. I, I think that the, the, the weakening of institutional legitimacy is at the very heart of that problem. Why do you think so many are choosing to live in that kind of a fantasy world? I, mean, I think there are a lot of explanations out there. We uh, are atomized as, as individuals. Um, it's been exacerbated by the year or you know, 10, 11 months that we've lived through now where we're having this conversation over a Zoom connection, but that has been the primary means at which we have connected with a lot of people. And I've I've shared this observation, and I, I wish I could remember where I had read it, that there's 
an almost uncanny valley effect to Zoom calls, uh, that it puts stress on our brain because we have this fake sense of intimacy with others because we see them through a computer screen, but we're not sharing the same physical space. And our brain knows something is, is wrong with that. So we're, we've been necessitated to live in almost a virtual reality world for the past 10, 11 months, but you know, we've had Lyman Stone on this podcast before talking about the increasing secularization of, uh, of America, um, which is not just a concern to an organization like ours that is interested in the importance of religious principles, but that is a primary source of community and human interconnectedness for so many people. Um, is I, I you know there it's probably an overdetermined phenomenon, but what is it in your opinion that is making us or many people desirous of living in a fantasy world rather than in the real world around them? Yeah, I I, I think all of that is right, and it's certainly the case that the the pandemic year has had a lot to do with the kinds of problems we're confronting now and with what we've seen throughout the year. I think it had a lot to do with the character of the Black Lives Matter protests. I think it has had a lot to do with the character of the post-election reaction on the right. Um, and it's connected to that, that broader trend, that longer running trend of what I would describe as a kind of alienation, a sense people have that they don't belong to something, or at least that they don't belong to our society as a whole, that it is this distant foreign thing that exists for the sake of other people, and that in their lives is mostly a source of oppression or at least a source of dissatisfaction. And so we can't actually, as human beings, live isolated. When we are isolated, we seek other forms of belonging. We seek other ways of understanding the world that allow us to interpret our isolation away. And I think some of the kind of conspiracism that you find in moments like that um, really exists to provide people with a different explanation of the situation they find themselves in. There's a desire to believe that somehow out there, the world is working out in the way that we would like. And so you find people who believe that um, that the president is ultimately fighting a kind of secret war. And what we see on the surface that looks like failure might actually be a path to a, a greater success. Uh, you know, the, 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 the QAnon theories fit into that kind of pattern of conspiracism. But I think more broadly, there's a desire to believe that the world is going to make sense in both a moral sense and a practical sense in the end. And that leads people into conspiracies and leads people to believe that there's just more going on than we see when what's going on that we see doesn't add up to any form of legitimate affiliation or appealing ways of belonging. People cannot live in a social and moral vacuum. It is impossible. And when they're forced into such a vacuum, they respond, they react, they build a different reality. Um, I think in part that means that the solution to this has got to involve some ways of reaffiliating, of bringing people out of that isolation and alienation. It also does require ways of enabling people to trust our institutions more, which ultimately means working to make them more trustworthy. That is a very, very challenging agenda for the coming years, but I think it's necessary if we're going to find our way toward a healthier political culture and, and a healthier culture in general. With what you said about bringing people out of that situation, what? how do we deal with the problem of if they're not desirous of being brought out of it? I had talked to um, our research director, Sam Gregg, several episodes back about the problem of woke capitalism. And I posed the question to him, what do you do when so much of the customer base of a lot of these corporations seems to desire the kind of woke capitalism. They are responding to their customers. It's not as if they are you know, actors operating only on a political agenda. They believe uh, they are responding to what their customers want. If people don't desire to be brought out of that circumstance, what, if anything, can we do about it? Well, I think that political leadership is not the same thing as consumer service, so that these challenges really are different. These companies exist to serve their consumers. And when this is what their consumers want, something like woke capitalism, which is very unhealthy for our society in a lot of ways, 
um, they're, they're going to provide it. They're going to find ways to do that. I think political leaders have got to see that they have a different kind of responsibility, that ultimately what they're responsible for is the good of the larger society and the good of their constituencies. And that does mean pushing back some against these forms of conspiracism. What you find in populist ages is that there's a combination, there's a mix of legitimate grievances, which are very real and complicated and often pose a huge challenge to the prevailing social order, a, a, a legitimate challenge that needs to be taken up, combined with some degree of this kind of conspiracism that exaggerates the, the wickedness of that social order and that m believes in made up stories about what it is that, that, that elites are doing, political leaders have to sift these apart and try to respond to legitimate grievances and genuine social problems using the, the levers at their disposal, whether that's government or civil society or uh, education or other forms of social engagement to take up the real problems and put aside the fake problems. That's just part of leadership in a democratic society. And I think part of what we're seeing is a failure at that level, a failure to, to distinguish between the kinds of complaints that are legitimate and appropriate and necessary and the kinds that are just not well-founded. It's hard to distinguish them because you, at some level, it puts you in tension with your voters. It puts you in tension with the people you want to represent. But that tension is necessary in a democracy. It's unavoidable. You can see why politicians don't want it, but you know that's too bad. No one, no one forced you to become a senator. Well, that is, is this, in a sense, a kind of collective action problem. As you said, there's a difference between being a political leader and doing consumer service. Uh, you'd mentioned before the nature of Congress right now that it's a platform to stand upon and try to get a better time slot on a cable news channel. And I've always thought that the best example of the current problem with Congress is a former congressman, and that's Jason Chaffetz, who explicitly left Congress for the purpose of becoming a cable news pundit. Um, are politicians, you know, on their individual levels, rather than acting as political leaders, they're engaged in that kind of consumer service to their voters. Um, how do you get, is this a just point to the institutional problem of political parties or of the political class in general, that you have a whole bunch of atomized politicians all doing the thing that serves their narrow individual interest without regard to any larger interest of either their party, their uh, chamber of government, or the country as a whole. Yeah, I think that does get toward the heart of the problem. And, and it's true, there are a lot of members of Congress, especially younger members now in both parties, who seem to see their job in Congress as a stepping to a stone on a career path that is basically in the in the communications arena, right? It's 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 a path to a cable TV show, it's a path to a, a, a bigger social media following, rather than seeing it in its own institutional terms and in democratic terms um, as a way to exercise some some leadership in our society. Yes, to serve your constituents and also to help your constituents uh, understand th their place in the, in the larger social whole. I, I, I think that that's a function of the incentives they confront. They're not crazy. They're not stupid, these politicians. And a lot of the incentives they face now, the ways of increasing their prominence, of becoming uh, more successful, have to do with uh, becoming more important players in that media ecosystem rather than becoming more effective legislators, which you basically don't get rewarded for at this point. I think that points in the direction of some institutional reforms in Congress. Um, I think it points in the direction of a different way of articulating the challenges our society faces. Conversations like this can help, where we talk about this problem and help to guilt some politicians into seeing what their role might be. But there's no alternative, it seems to me, to some structural and institutional changes. Strengthening the parties, which you pointed to, is one of them. I think our parties have really become just platforms. Um, they, don't, they don't exercise any formative shaping authority. They only offer a way uh, to stand on a stage and be seen and heard. And that's not sufficient. That's not, the, 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 that purpose is just not worthwhile. But when the parties have more power, which they can have through changes in our, um, in, in our campaign finance system, which they can have through changes in the way that candidate selection works, um, those parties 
the, our two big parties, when they work, actually work as moderating forces in our politics. They force politicians to be part of a bigger coalition and therefore to be more realistic about the actual shape of our political life. When they're not there, the politicians are operating as uh, as as lone wolves, and their incentives are almost entirely about prominence and self promotion. So between that and some congressional reforms, I, I've I've argued for a long time for less transparency in Congress, which is not a very popular case to make, but for having some spaces that are not televised, so that members can actually bargain and negotiate, which ultimately is what Congress exists to enable. Um, and you know, it seems to me that the, the total transparency, which create, which turns every deliberative space into a performative space, makes it impossible for deliberation to happen. And we shouldn't be surprised that it doesn't happen. But how do you unring those bells? Um, so you you have had that great push for more transparency in government, and people know more of what is going on. Um, you have almost everything that happens in Congress is on C-SPAN. Even I'm talking to you from Chicago. Uh, you can watch city council meetings. There's not much to them, but you can watch Chicago city council meetings on local public access. Uh, it, it is a difficult argument to make that you yep. should know less of what is going on in your government. Um, how How would you go about trying to persuade people that, these kinds of things are necessary if we want uh, a better functioning society, especially against the backdrop of and one of the major issues we haven't even addressed yet is social media, um, the big tech concerns, which are basically the democratization of everything. We've given everybody a voice on their own, their own individual platform, rather than doing what I think we've been talking about through this entire conversation, channeling it through some kind of an organization or an institution to try to change things. So instead of working with those local organizations, someone fires off a mean tweet and they think they've done something. Well, I think the argument for that begins from the fact that things aren't going great. People are not satisfied with the state of our of our politics with the state of our institutions in general. And so we have to take that that dissatisfaction, which I think is justified and therefore constructive, and ask ourselves, why aren't things going well? What is it that's not happening that should be? What is it that's happening that shouldn't be? And that does begin to point you toward an argument for the purpose of these institutions that is not purely uh, democratic and that is not purely performative. There, it has to be largely democratic, certainly. This is always a matter of balance, of proportion, um, of degree. So we do need transparency in government. But if you have total transparency, if there is nowhere for politicians to talk to each other when they're not also talking to television viewers, then they don't do their job. You say the city council meetings, there's not much to them and they're televised. There's not much to them because they're televised. The city council does do some work it does do some traditional kind of deal making, but it doesn't do them in city council meetings, and it has to stretch to find ways to do them. The same thing happens in Congress. The only places members can really talk to each other is in the leadership offices at midnight before a government shutdown. And so that's where all the work gets done. And they produce these thousand page bills uh, and, and and have two hours to vote on them because there's nowhere else for them to actually do the kind of work that results in legislation. I think that argument has to be made in the face of the case for pure transparency and begin from the fact that the system we have now isn't serving us well. It's created these problems. We've just been through a, a week of terrible crisis in Washington that is by no means over. And a moment like this should force us to ask, why is this happening, right? That's why we're having this conversation. And I think the fact that part of the reason it's happening is that we have pushed too far in the direction of a kind of performative politics is the only way that we could possibly make the argument for a less performative politics. It won't be easy. It's not an easy argument to make, and it won't. it's not an easy set of changes to pursue. But if that's what's needed, then not being easy, uh, you know, it's just a fact of life. We got to work with it. Let's turn our attention for a moment to the events of uh, January 6th with the um, invasion of the U.S. Capitol. I was listening the Monday before that to the uh, Reason Magazine editor's podcast, and Nick Gillespie, 
uh, had made the argument that looking back at the uh, the challenges of the four years of uh, the Trump administration, that, as he put it, the institutions held, that they were challenged, um, they were uh, – sledgehammers were s- swung at them repeatedly. But we were two weeks out from a transition from one president to another, just as we have had so many times throughout American history – and that was all before what happened on Wednesday. I'm curious what your thoughts are on – we've talked about the weakness of institutions, the failings of institutions. Um, would, would you ag- agree even with uh, holding – you know, looking back at Wednesday, um, January 6th, um, that institutions held? Or was this just – do you think it was just another challenge to those institutions? Well, yes, I think it's true. The institutions held, but they're under enormous strain and pressure that they won't be able to hold against forever. And so we have to take that strain and pressure seriously, but we also have to see that broadly speaking, they did hold. We are going to have an inauguration on January 20th. We are going to have, uh, and look, maybe we shouldn't be 100% sure of anything, but it sure looks likely that we're going to have a peaceful transition of power um, and that ultimately our politics will continue to function. We've seen some key institutions hold in important ways. The courts have held up well under tremendous strain and pressure. Um, We've seen that in the post-election months where judges, including judges appointed by this president, have been under enormous pressure to think politically or in a partisan way and have all resisted it without exception. We've seen state election officials, including those from President Trump's own party, uh, resist the pressure to deform and distort the results of the election or to pretend that things happened that did not happen, sometimes resist direct pressure. I think that phone call that was uh, surreptitiously recorded between the president and two Georgia state election officials um, is an example of the institutions holding. They listened to him and they said, no, that's not what happened and it's not what we're going to do. That's what that's what it looks like when the institutions hold. They hold under strain, under pressure. It doesn't mean that they don't face pressure. It means that they survive the pressure, and they have. But the pressure is a huge problem, and it cannot continue forever without affecting the functioning of these institutions. We've also seen some of the institutions just function very poorly. Congress is not working well. Congress is the central and preeminent institution in our system of government at the federal level. And it has buckled some under the pressure of the, of recent years. It had been already in quite weak shape, and it has to be revitalized and recovered. Its central place in the system has to be recovered. The executive branch has not worked wonderfully in this period. I mean, we've seen some of the institutions hold in the sense that people have been willing to defy orders or ignore instructions from the president in order to uphold their broader responsibility. Is that an example of the institution holding or of the institution failing? I don't know. I mean, I think in some important ways, uh, it's a, it's an example of holding, but the kind of pressure and strain that it's been under suggests the need for change, for some reform, for some rethinking. I think we're entering a period that needs to be a period of, of reform in American life, that needs to respond to some of the problems we've seen. Um, by changing how government works. And those kinds of changes are also needed outside of government, but that has to be more of a process of persuasion and social evolution. In government, I think it's time for a period of, of reform and rethinking. So I agree, the institutions have held, but we have a lot of evidence for thinking that they need our help and they need to be improved. Well, I think of the words reform and rebuild, and I look over the copy of your book that I have here, which is a time to build, which is, you know, there's no re before the word there. Yes. Um, and you reminded me in your answer there, in calling out the judiciary, uh, that there may be a really good example that we can uh, learn from of the way an institution was built from nothing to have an incredible impact. And that prior to the 1980s, there really was no organization or dedicated effort around the ideas of judicial originalism. The Federalist Society is formed as a result of that and has helped to educate um, 
lots of lawyers who have become judges who have now taken places on district and federal and Supreme Court benches um, to all in furtherance of an idea and a very concrete idea in our minds, but not as something as uh, tangible that you can hold in your hand. I and mean, is this, is this, to me, it seems like a good example of the exact kind of building that we need to do now in keeping with the title of your book. I think it's absolutely right. Uh, institutional revitalization is a combination of building and rebuilding. There are some institutions that can't really be replaced by alternatives. Uh, the family is an example of that, but so is Congress, right? We, we, we can't just say, well, we'll build an alternative Congress and people will just use that to, to govern. Uh, it doesn't work that way. There are some things that have to be fixed when they're broken. But the process of doing that can involve institutional formation and creation. Uh, there are ways of addressing problems that can only be done by building something new. And there are also ways of rebuilding that require building something new. I think the Federal Society is a great example of that. It's built around an idea of revitalization, of relearning what the role of the judge actually needs to be. But in itself, it was a new thing. It was created to enable that revitalization. I think we're in a moment now in, in conservative constitutional thought, or at least we ought to be, that is a lot like the moment that created the Federalist Society, a moment where it seemed like it was necessary to rethink the role of the judge from the bottom up, from scratch, that we had totally forgotten what that role is. I think something like that is now true about Congress. We're at a moment when we've basically forgotten the purpose of our national legislature, and there needs to be some intellectual work done to rebuild a case for the Constitution with Congress at its center, the kind of work that led to originalism, which you know we think originalism is just common sense or that it always was there, but it didn't exist at all before the middle of the 1970s as a self-conscious set of ideas. Um, it is time, I think, for people on the right who care about the Constitution to engage in work like that around Congress and time to change the institution in ways that could enable that way of understanding it to really take hold and become our common sense. The success of originalism in that way it really is a lesson. You know, today, even on the left where they disagree, they basically form their views of, of the role of the judge in response to originalism. Uh, so that both sides now basically are locked in a conversation about whether it's right to understand the judge's role in relation to the original meaning of the Constitution. That is an amazing achievement of the conservative legal movement over the course of just about a generation and a half. And it suggests that this kind of revitalization may be possible, which is good to see. Let's close here on, we look around at what happened on Wednesday the 6th, we look at the last handful of years, we look at the last decade, we look at the last two decades, and we have a tendency to, I think, focus on the negative um, and a lot of the problems that we've had. We've spent most of this conversation talking about the problems that we have, and I think there's an important role for that in identifying, you know, you have to first admit what the problems are before you can begin to address them. What as you look around, makes you hopeful for the future of our ability to recover from these problems, to pull out of these problems, and to solve the. Well, I don't even want to say solve. It's my own, yeah. my own uh, reconception of my own conservatism over the last uh, handful of years is that you problems are rarely ever fixed. You just make them a little less worse over time. What, what, uh, what makes you hopeful for the future there? I would say this. I, I agree with you. I think problems are not permanently fixed. Problems that are that are serious enough to occupy our politics at its core tend to be durable human problems. And that means that they're generational. They're going to recur. And if we succeed in managing them in this generation, the very ways in which we do that are going to create a new set of problems that we will have to respond to in a different way. And then these problems will reemerge. That's not a failure. That's just what it is to live in a human society. And I think we should think about our role as sustaining that society and what it makes possible for another generation to arise and deal with its own set of problems, which will be eerily similar to ours. There's no way around that. But I do think we can be successful in doing that. And I do think there are reasons to think so now. We've become more aware of the of the challenge of legitimacy uh, 
in the liberal society over the past 10 or 15 years than we were before. That challenge was there, and it was a source of enormous social problems, but our politics was successfully ignoring it in, say, the late 1990s to the, to the middle uh, of the 2000s. Um, it's not ignoring it anymore. And more than that, I think our politics has moved from a phase in which both of our major parties were arguing to were arguing in ways that tried to dominate our definition of liberty. They both said, we own this idea of liberty, and that's what we're for. And conservatives sometimes meant economic liberty, progressives meant kind of social and cultural liberty. Both of them now recognize that alongside liberty, not instead of it, they also need to be talking about uh, something more like solidarity. And we have increasingly focused on solidarity in our politics, national unity, some sense of belonging and common purpose. These things are absolutely essential in the life of a free society. And we ignored them for a very long time in American political life from about the middle of the 20th century until pretty recently, these were not central ideas in our political discussions. And as a result, they withered, they, they became weaker. And our emphasis on individualism, which had enormous benefits, also had enormous costs. I think we're doing a better job now of seeing those costs and thinking about how to confront them. We haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. We're not doing a great job of actually dealing with these problems. But seeing them is a first step, and we weren't even doing that 10 or 15 years ago. So in that sense, I think we have made progress. Yuval Levin is Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and Editor of National Affairs. Yuval, thank you so much for joining us today on Act in Line. Thanks very much for having me. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can reach our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Act in Line, I'm Eric Cohn.